All right, let me see what else we have here tonight. Um, John Smith says, when the Eastern Church broke away, what was the basic reason? You know what? I think until this day, we really don't know what the real reason is. It's been a thousand years, and we still I don't think we still know what the real reason was. We, we know the possibilities, but what was the straw that broke the camel's back? That's what I'm referring to. Um, so, you know what? I just noticed this question is up here. It's probably... Oh. Well, let me go back. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, we have this whole issue about the filioque, you know, whether the Holy Spirit was um, proceeded from the Father and the Son or just the Father. But to me, that was such an esoteric issue of theology that both sides have evidence for. And it comes down to one side making the judgment. And of course, you know, it's going to be the Pope. And the other side's going to be wrong by default. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast. So it's hard for me to wrap my brain around the idea that you would have such a monumental split of Christians over such an esoteric doctrine you know, uh, of, of the Trinity that hardly anybody understands anyway. Um, but, you know, when it comes down to it, you got to make the decision. He either proceeds from two or one. So, you know, you make the decision and then the other side is wrong by default. And then it's a question of what they're going to do about it. So, but the political situation at that time was so tenuous because the East had grown sufficiently and the West had grown and they were two mega um, entities. And when you put the human element into that mix, it's not long before you can see why there would be a rift right down the middle. So, And I think the political reasons reign to this day. There's always been a struggle between East and West. Because the lines of communication, that's what makes it difficult, you know. It's not like you can get on the Internet today and communicate with somebody from the East. Um, not back in those days, of course. So you were limited in your exercise of power in commensurate with the rate at which your message could get out to the people that you controlled. If your message couldn't get out to them, you had no control over them. Or if it took a long time for your message to get out, unless you had an army to back it up, like the Romans did, you know, they were ruthless. They sent the message out. They also sent the armies out to make sure that it was enforced. Uh, but the Pope doesn't have that prerogative. You don't send armies out from the Vatican. Um, you know, you have churches and bishops to make sure things are. But, wow, if you say, if the Pope says something the bishop doesn't like or just doesn't find feasible for, the, for his people and his time and his locale, you know, you're going to get some rustlings out there. And the bishop's going to talk to another bishop and said, you know, the Pope said this, but, you know, we just can't make this work. And, you know, it's going to hurt us. That's going to hurt them. And you can see, you know, because of, of the distance and the lack of communication, how things could start to break down. 
Yeah, even in the Christian church. Uh, so that to me, since it's the ongoing reason, is the reason. Um, but of course, then after the filioque, you have, you know, the issue about papal infallibility and about Mary and about purgatory. And so you get this laundry list of problems that start to crop up once the filioque issue is the reason for the main explosion. Okay. So it's not just the filioque. There's a, a, a list, half a dozen doctrines, major doctrines that the East hasn't succumbed to that the West has not the West has formulated and the East just does not want to obey. So, you know, this is life. This is what you expect to happen. Um, you know, we just have to live with it. We just live with it. Um, all right, we got about five minutes left here. In 1 Corinthians 11, where it talks about women praying with their head uncovered, some people say it refers to women's hair rather than a veil or some sort. What is the proper inter interpretation of this? No, that's wrong. And that's not the way the church has interpreted it. Um, what Paul is saying is, look, your hair shows you that you have a natural covering. So all the more that you should wear a covering on your head when you're praying in the church, okay? If nature tells you that you have a covering when you stand next to your man, uh, your husband, uh, well, all the more the church is telling you to put a covering on, okay? So nature tells you and the church is telling you. That's the reason why he says that, okay? Now you can see the details of this exegesis in my commentary on 1 Corinthians, which is for sale at robertsongenis.org. So feel free. 